Thanks a lot. Yeah, now we are recording. Okay, so uh, we have this uh, representation of uh, the field. And uh, now let me just uh, mention a couple of uh, other interesting things about these fields. Um, these fields also appear as uh, certain scaling limits. So let me start with this picture. So on the left, so this is a random plane wave. And this one is what is called random spherical harmonic. Uh, and uh, I think uh, when you just look at these two pictures, it's quite clear that, well, they are very similar. And so what happens uh, is that, so what is a random spherical harmonic? So uh, on sphere, we have uh, spherical harmonics and they're again functions of Laplacian on the sphere. So if we fix dimension uh, degree n, there is uh, n, sorry, 2n plus 1 dimensional space of uh, spherical harmonics of degree and we equip it with L2 uh, norm, and now it's a Hilbert space. And now it's a finitely dimensional Hilbert space, so we can uh, uh, define canonical uh, Gaussian vector. And this is uh, exactly, sorry, um, this uh, field. So we fix degree and take a Gaussian combination of spherical harmonics of this degree. And uh, then you can, uh, what we want to do is pass to the limit as uh, degree goes to infinity. Uh, and then what happens is uh, we, so we have our field defined on a sphere. So if we can take, well, we can take any point, X naught and uh, look at exponential map. And then we can define uh, a field in this tangent plane, which is F N of U, which is uh, our spherical harmonic of degree N, we have exponential map of x naught u over n. Uh, and then what happens is that uh, for spherical harmonics, so covariance kernel of a random spherical harmonic is the following thing. It's uh, Legendre polynomial of degree n of cosine of spherical distance between x and y. Uh, and then uh, uh, the following holds that a pn of cosine theta asymptotically behaves like theta over sine theta j naught of n plus one half theta plus or small of one over n. So this is asymptotic of Legendre polynomials when n goes to infinity. Uh, this is uh, called uh, Hilbs uh, asymptotic. Uh, excuse me, what is uh, F capital N? Uh, so this is definition. So uh -huh. I define, so basically I just uh, project my field from sphere to tangent plane by exponential map. And why do so, we need this? Uh, okay, so what happens? 
So there is wavelength, which is one over n. So mm -hmm. I rescale by n. Now my wavelength is one. Mm -hmm. uh, and so if you look at tiny bit of sphere, there are a lot of wavelengths. So imagine that you take, you look at small piece of sphere where sphere is almost flat. And n is so large that there are a lot of wavelengths inside this small patch. Mm -hmm. Now you kind of rescale this patch so that wavelengths become one. Okay. Mm -hmm. And kind of you flatten this uh, page. So ex exponent is kind of uh, is uh, locally distance preserving map from manifold to its tangent plane. And uh, how do we use this in the following? Um, so it, this it just seems like uh, in the following we we just didn't use. For example, we didn't use this symbol F N. F capital N. Uh, hold on a second. Uh, you will see it in a moment. So we have this asymptotic for Legendre. But now, what is covariance uh, of F capital N? Well, uh, this is Pn cosine of spherical distance between exponent of u over n and exponent of v over n. Uh, all right? Mm -hmm. So uh, when u and v are fixed and n is large, u over n and v over n, they are uh, very small. So exponent is almost isometry. Mm -hmm. And uh, spherical distance is almost uh, Euclidean distance. So this thing is approximately u minus v over n. Mm -hmm. And now let's look at Hilt's asymptotic. So now our theta is modulus of u minus v over n, so it's very small. So the first square root goes to one. Uh, then inside Bessel function, n will cancel out. And so what we have is that Kn of uv behaves asymptotically as J naught of u minus v. So what happens is if you risk, if you uh, look at tiny patch on a sphere with very, very high n, and then you rescale it so that it becomes kind of flat and uh, wavelength one, that then what you will see is the random plane wave. So that's... Uh, the main conclusion. So a uh, random spherical harmonic converges to random plane wave. Okay. Does it make sense? Um, yep. Uh couldn't we take uh, maybe some uh, field which is a little better than the one with covariance G, uh, J0 and uh, like rescale everything in another way and obtain uh, some kind of asymptotics uh, j just not to work with the, the terrible field uh, well, with covariance you, G0. You, okay, so you see... Uh, mm, Unfortunately, uh, well, at least when we talk about Egin functions, so this is what you get. So, uh, because uh, in some sense, it tells us that 
a tip, well, typical eigenfunction of Laplacian. So you see here we are taking linear combination of um, Laplace eigenfunctions with the same eigenvalue. And so this is a typical eigenfunction of Laplacian and it is what it is. It looks like a random plane wave which has this unpleasant covariance kernel. There is another possibility. You, uh, instead of space of all uh, uh, of uh, spherical harmonics of fixed degree, you look at L2 space of all spherical harmonics of degrees from zero to n. And then this thing also will have a similar scaling limit, but it will converge to a field which is called a uh, band limited uh, field. And this is field so that its spectral measure is uh, the is the normalized Lebesgue measure on the unit disk instead of circle. And now this is a nice measure. But now you are mixing uh, eigenfunctions with very, very different uh, eigenvalues. Okay, yeah, okay. And by the way, you can play this game on any manifold. So if you take a compact manifold, uh, then you, well, spe unlike sphere, spectral, uh, spectrum will be simple. So all eigenvalues have only one eigenfunction. And now uh, we can order them by um, size of eigenvalue. And then you take n eigenfunctions with eigen uh, numbers around n squared. And take the uh, Gaussian linear combination. Then the, this linear combination will converge to the same random plane wave. So it's kind of a universal thing. Uh, and another example is this is uh, Bergman Fock. And this is something which is called Costland. So Costland ensemble is a, a canonical model for project for real projective varieties. So what's going on here is again we look at homogeneous polynomials of degree n and we kind of restrict them to the sphere and uh, to be a kind of uh, more precise we should res restrict it to uh, projective sphere but uh, I prefer to work with the uh, usual sphere, but uh, of course there is some symmetry. Uh, and now this is a nice finitely dimensional space and you can equip it with a, a lot of different scalar products. There is only one scalar, so, sorry, there are a lot of scalar products that are invariant under rotations of the sphere, but there is only one product such that if you complexify it, then it's invariant on the uh, unitary group. And this uh, scalar product is called uh, Fubini Studi metric. So this is a very natural metric on space of homogeneous polynomials. And with this uh, norm, the following functions form, so where J is a multi-index Uh, and uh, x to the j is like x1 to j1, x2, j to the j2, x3 to the j3. And so when we look at f 
which is sum of a j uh, where a j are id standard gaussians then this is a canonical model for a homogeneous polynomial of degree n and zero set is a real a real projective variety so zero sets are kind of universal model for well uh, if you want a natural notion of a random projective variety then this is the right answer and then covariance will be so this is a, a simple uh, computation this will be cosine to the power n of spherical distance between x and y and now if you rescale like before but now you rescale by square root of n instead of n uh, then uh, covariance of fn converges as n goes to infinity well if you take cosine to the power n of x over root of n then in the limit you will uh, get a gaussian function so this converges to e to the minus x minus y squared over 2 which is bargman fork so these random polynomials uh, converge to bargman fork field okay uh any questions so far uh, by, by the way, uh, I have a, a comment about question you asked last time about random polynomials uh, and uh, why people care about them. So I mentioned uh, some models that uh, appeared kind of in 40s, but there is another place where random polynomials appear. So when you study random matrices and random matrices appear in uh, physics, then uh, you might want to look at the spectrum. Now, what is a spectrum of a matrix? Uh, it's made of zeros of characteristic polynomial. When you have random matrix, its characteristic polynomial is a random polynomial. So spectrum of a random matrix can be written as zeros of a random polynomial. So that's uh, another way to think about uh, random polynomials. Yeah, that's interesting. Thank you. Um, okay, now, uh, so this is uh, the end of uh, kind of a crash course uh, in uh, uh, general theory of Gaussian fields. And uh, now let's uh, talk about what we can do with them. And uh, first uh, comment is that if you want to know some local information, then Katz Rice uh, can give you all the answers. So it might be technically horribly difficult thing, but in theory, it's doable. So Katz Rice. Uh, can give gives all uh, local information. So, for example, you want to know expected number of critical points in in a domain. You can compute it by by cuts rise. You want to know variance uh, of number of critical points. Cuts rise will do it. You want to know uh, moments of, I know, length of uh, level sets, Katz Rice can do it. But what Katz Rice cannot do it is to compute non local observables. So, 
So what do I mean by non-local? The idea is this, say you have a domain and you want to compute, say you have a field and this is where F is equal to zero. So you want to compute length, then what you can do is to chop it into tiny pieces, compute length inside each piece and add it. So because of this, we have these integral formulas uh, uh, that give us length. But now imagine that I want to know number of connected components. So I have some box and now these are say le level lines of my field. So here field is say positive, uh, sorry. And uh, here it's negative. And I want to know how many uh, nodal components do I have? Well, uh, if I know that say my function is positive here and it's positive here, then uh, there is no way to do some local analysis and to figure out are these two kind of uh, positive patches, are they in the same connected component or not? There is just no integral formula like that. Uh, so for a very, very long time, questions like these, they were completely out of reach. So it's possible to do some simple uh, local analysis. Uh, if you have a nodal domain, then in each say, uh, in this domain where F is positive, there is a local maximum. So in every positive domain, there is local maximum and every negative, there is local minimum. So number of nodal domains is bounded by number of critical points. Uh, and number of critical points is a local observable, which is at least theoretically computable, but it's just an upper bound. So if you want to say something more, uh, you cannot. And the question about number of nodal domains is, a, is particularly important uh, for this picture. And this is what physicists have been thinking about for quite some time. Uh, when I said that um, random plane wave is a universal model for high energy eigenfunctions of Laplacian, I actually cheated a little bit. So it's true for generic do domains, but uh, it's not necessarily true for all domains. And the real uh, difference is whether billiard dynamics in this domain is chaotic or integrable. But uh, figuring out whether it's chaotic or integrable is a hard uh, problem. So it's much easier to just compute number of nodal domains. And uh, depending on whether it's integrable or chaotic, statistics of number of nodal domains is different. So this could be used as an observable, which helps you to distinguish between kind of uh, chaotic and integrable behavior of quantum systems. So it's kind of a useful thing. Uh, okay, and uh, then, uh, uh, historically, what happened is that first progress was, uh, well, appeared uh, about uh, uh, slightly more than 10 years ago 
in context of uh, random spherical harmonics. So what is the number of nodal domains of a random spherical harmonic? And this is actually very uh, close to a classical question. So random spherical harmonic is a uh, very well studied example of Laplace eigen function and number of nodal domains for Laplace eigen functions uh, is a classical subject of study and probably one of the first results is uh, a theorem of current. Uh, for every spherical harmonic. So it's not about randomness, it's deterministic result, number of nodal domains is at most n, sorry, n squared. This is completely deterministic result. Constant one in front of n squared can be uh, slightly improved. So uh, there is classical result of Pliel, uh, which reduced to something like point, uh, 0 0.6. And then uh, about three years ago, there was a result of Bourguin who improved it a little bit more, but at least the order is n squared. But uh, there is no uh, lower bound. So there is a, a example by Levy. Uh, there is a spherical harmonic with uh, one or two nodal lines depending on parity of n. So depending on whether n is even or odd, we have spherical harmonics with uh, like two or three. So anyway, uh, the deterministically, there are uh, spherical harmonics with just uh, very few nodal domains. And now uh, the question me. is, Yes. Uh, can you please define what are nodal domains and nodal lines? Sorry, uh, not, nodal domains are just uh, zero. Uh, sorry, nodal lines are uh, just lines where function is zero. So it's zero level set. Uh -huh. And nodal domains are domains where function is positive or negative. So nodal lines split uh, our space into domains. These domains are called nodal domains. Uh -huh. Yeah, thank you. So it's just about zero level. And uh, the main breakthrough uh, happened in 2007 when uh, Nazarov and Sodin proved the following theorem that there is some mysterious constant A, we only know that it's positive, such that if you look at the probability that number of nodal domains of a spherical harmonic of degree n rescaled by n squared, probability that this random variable deviates from A by more than epsilon is bounded by some constant e to the minus some other constant n. So what we have is that if you take spherical random spherical harmonic uh, of large degree, then with very, very, very high probability, after you rescale it by natural scaling, it will exponentially concentrate around certain constant. 
Okay. Uh, do we here have a dimension fixed to like two dimensional sphere? Yes. So, uh, 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 mm -hmm. uh, but uh, actually, uh, this was the first result, but in fact, uh, this is uh, true in uh, higher dimensions, just instead of uh, n squared, you have to rescale by n to the dimension of the sphere. So you see kind of random plane wave uh, or random spherical harmonic, they have wavelength, which is of order one over n. And so typical nodal domain is of size one over n. So its area is of size one over n to the dimension. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Uh, so this was uh, the first result, which actually kind of uh, revolutionized uh, the field, and then it was uh, improved and uh, if we work instead of sphere, let's work uh, in Rn, and then we can, uh, well, they proved, well, 10 years later, they proved the following result. So now this is something uh, very recent. So let F uh, be a stationary field uh, with a spectral measure uh, rho. Uh, and then we uh, need the following assumptions. First, integral of, uh, well, uh, rho has uh, finite moments of order four plus epsilon. Uh, second is that rho has no atoms. And then three rho is not supported on a hyperplane. Well, linear. So I mean a hyperplane going through the origin. Then there is certain constant which is non-negative such that for every open convex S such that zero is in S number of nodal domains of F inside. So we take our set S and rescale it to size R. So you can think that S is just unit ball and we look at number of nodal domains inside ball of radius R. And then we rescale it by R to the N times volume of S. So this means that we are computing number of nodal domains per unit volume. This converges to A, uh, almost surely end in L1. Uh, and finally, if a support of rho contains an 
open set or a circle uh, around origin. Then this constant A is strictly positive. Um, so let's, uh, I think now it's a good time to have a short break and uh, let's continue in uh, uh, like three minutes. Okay, so uh, now uh, let's continue. So let me explain uh, the meaning of uh, these uh, assumptions. So let's start with the first one. So if measure has moments up to order four, then its Fourier transform is four plus epsilon times differentiable, which means that our field is almost certainly two times, well, two plus epsilon times differentiable. So first implies that F is in C2 with probability one. And this can be relaxed a little bit. So you can ask for fourth moment, then field will be C2 minus, and that's enough. Now, second means that our field is ergodic. So uh, what I mean by this is, uh, our well shifts act on on the field, and so sh and since our field is stationary, this action is uh, uh, measure preserving. Uh, and then, uh, if you take a, a nice functional and average it over shifts, you uh, have convergence. So I will uh, explain it uh, in uh, a bit more details in a moment. Uh, so uh, no atoms uh, means uh, ergodicity. And then uh, the fact that our field, our spectral measure is not restricted to a hyperplane uh, implies that uh, <clears throat> the law uh, of gradient of F is non-degenerate. Uh, okay, and now we have this mysterious condition four. And let me explain. So four is actually not the strongest condition. Uh, and what we really need is the following condition kind of four prime. So there is say certain R naught and F naught from our Cameron Martin space such that F naught has a nodal domain inside B zero R naught. So if we take ball of radius R, 
then there is a nodal domain inside it. And uh, great, there is no x in B are not such that f of x is zero and gradient of f is zero. So we have our domain and there is a certain function. Uh, so let's say f is positive here, f is negative here. Let me explain why uh, this uh, implies that our mysterious constant is positive. So the idea is actually it's a first kind of uh, example of these perturbation ideas that I use that I used a lot in uh, this area. So the idea is the following. So let f F naught is an element of Hilbert space. So we can create a, an orthonormal basis such that F naught is an element of this basis. So uh, there is basis, which is uh, like F naught, F one, and so on. And then uh, what we know is that f is just sum of a k f k, and this series converges locally uniformly. Uh, and then, well, in particular, well, uh, then the idea is this: there is positive probability. Well, so. Uh, there is n such that uh, norm of sum of a k f k where k is from n to infinity and now this is like say c1 norm in in this ball this is less than epsilon so uh, with uh, probability almost one. So we have this convergent series. So its tail is very, very small with, a, with very, very large probability. And then uh, there is po with positive probability, A naught is very large. And A one, A N minus one are very small. Since we have only finitely many of these, of course, each Gaussian can be small with a positive probability. Since uh, they are independent, so with a small but positive probability, first n of them will be small. And then what we have? Uh, then uh, f behaves like f naught because next uh, n terms they are very small because of coefficient, and the tail is very small uh, because it's the tail of convergent series. So we can write it like this. So it's f is f naught plus some small error. And then this is where we need condition that uh, our function has no, uh, so that zero is not a critical level. So if you have a function, and you have a zero, it's zero set. And on this zero set, gradient is not zero. If you perturb function a little bit, then the nodal line will be perturbed a little bit. So then this implies that uh, 
nodal line of F is close to the nodal line of F naught. And uh, this happens with positive probability. So it means that with positive probability, F has a nodal domain inside ball of radius R naught. And now if you take ball of large radius, then we cover it, well, we can, sorry, not cover, we fit inside approximately R over R naught to the power n discs of radius R naught. And then expected number of nodal domains uh, is at least some positive constant because in each ball we have positive probability to have at least one domain uh, expectation is additive uh, even if things are correlated and so we have this that expected number of nodal domains uh, is at least some constant times r Okay, so this is what is called barrier method. So the idea is this, we construct a deterministic example, and then we can show that if in Hilbert space, something could happen deterministically, and from functional point of view, this situation is uh, stable, so it does not change on the small perturbation of a function then the same thing can happen with a positive probability. And if it has positive probability in a fixed ball, then it has a positive density in the entire plane. So that's uh, uh, the idea. Okay, uh, any questions so far? Okay, then um, let me just uh, briefly mention how this uh, theorem is proved. So first is that uh, there is purely geometric statement that if you look at number of nodal domains uh, or any other kind of uh, curves inside some ball of radius, well, maybe let me, to simplify notation, I will write R. So this is number of nodal domains in disk of radius R centered at the origin of some function uh, F. Then this is bounded by number, well, you integrate over slightly larger ball And then you have uh, so what we have here n star u r f is number of nodal domains that intersect 
ball of radius r centered at point u. So, uh, and without star is number of domains that are in completely inside. And n star is number of domains that either inside or cross the boundary. So this is purely geometric thing. It's just kind of a uh, double count in lemma. So uh, for or you move point and you look at how many uh, uh, domains are inside this uh, disk of uh, a bit smaller uh, radius. And then what we do is uh, <coughs> we uh, kind of rescale everything by volume of a uh, large ball. Uh, and <clears throat> then here we'll get Shouldn't we have uh, B of R plus R small on the left? Sir, uh, this is uh, R minus R. Sorry? Oh, so sm smaller ball. Yes, so lower bound is smaller ball, upper bound is larger ball. And uh, for lower bound, we don't have this N star, we have N. It's without N star. without star. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> so Uh, so then I just <clears throat> uh, rescale by volume uh, of uh, B <clears throat> R and here I get similar things. So this is And this is, uh, uh, well, when we will pass to the limit, this will uh, become one. Now, I want to compare n star and n. So what is the, so first of all, clearly it's non-negative. So we have some <clears throat> nodal domains inside and some nodal domains that intersect. And then let's make the following observation. Let's look at restriction of our function to the boundary of this disk. And if nodal domain intersect, then this restriction must have an extremal point here. So this is less than number of critical points of F restricted to the boundary. Is it clear? So kind of if you look uh, at the boundary and function on the boundary, you have two zeros and then function does something like this, so there is a local extremum between every two zeros. Uh, alternatively, this is uh, number of zeros of f restricted to the boundary. Uh, but now this is something that is computable using cuts rise. And since our field is stationary, uh, zeros, they have density. So this is something of order constant times length 
of the boundary. And when you have disk of radius R, its volume is of order R squared and length is of order R. So in the limit, it goes to, the, to zero. And now uh, we just uh, have, in these integrals, we have things like n u r f divided by volume of b r d u, and we integrate over some ball. And then we can, uh, this can be rewritten as integral o now instead of u we have zero and we apply shift by u to the function f okay so uh, tau u of f is f of x plus u it's a uh, uh, exactly the same uh, thing. Okay, but uh, <clears throat> now uh, this is uh, uh, exactly statement of uh, ergodic theorem. So we have shifts that act ergodically. And then uh, we have this functional number of nodal domains uh, in a ball of radius R centered at the origin. And we uh, integrate over shifts. Okay, so, uh, well, uh, this is just a constant. And then we have this one of a volume of ball of radius R plus r then by ergodicity this goes to expected number of nodal domains in disk of radius r divided by volume So this is ergodicity. So we pass to the limit when this uh, goes to infinity. And uh, if you go back, then lower bound is of the same type. And so by sandwiching, we have the limit. So uh, what we have is that lower limit of expectation of number of this over volume of BR. So low limit is less than upper limit. Uh, and uh, then we have uh, like expectation of, sorry. I don't need it. so I don't need this expectation. So I have expectation of number of zero uh, R over volume plus small. Well, sorry, in the limit, this small disappears. And here we have expectation And so we have the limit. Okay. Uh, so the, uh, I skipped a lot of technicalities, but uh, is the main kind of uh, idea behind the proof clear? Yeah, it is. So it's kind of a combination of purely geometric statement, which is actually valid not only for nodal domains, if you have any collection of uh, domains this is true and then you uh, apply ergodicity and um, you so clearly uh, 
we need uh, our functions to be at least C1 so that uh, we can uh, talk about stability, but we need actually a bit more than C1, but the C2 so that we can do this perturbation analysis uh, and also we can, and uh, we, we need a gradient to be non-degenerate uh, to say that, uh, again, we have some stability under perturbations to essentially apply Bulinska lemma. And actually, as you can see, this argument is pretty soft. So uh, it's kind of uh, just uh, ergodic abstract nonsense. And because of this, it can be generalized to a lot of uh, other uh, situations. So for example, uh, in say, in, if instead of uh, nodal domains, uh, you want to look at uh, domains, say, for example, doubly connected domains. Uh, proof goes almost the same way. You can even look at, and this uh, have been done by Sarnak and Wigman. Uh, you can look at, for example, expected number of, well, maybe pictures like this. Say you have doubly connected domain. Uh, it has two holes where F is negative. Then maybe here you have so that this uh, domain where function is negative is simply connected and this one is doubly connected and inside it's a simply connected. So you can draw any picture like that. Rescale by volume of BR and there is a limit. So any kind of topology, any kind of nesting, it will work. Uh, and uh, you also can do it with geometry instead of topology. And this was uh, done by uh, Igor Wigman and myself. So you look at expected number of domains with, uh, say, area comparable to something and perimeter comparable to something. This will also work. So basically, uh, you can specify a lot of different properties as long as these properties are stable under small perturbations. So for example, uh, <clears throat> this kind of ergodic part uh, is very stable. And then uh, also we need that these limits are strictly positive. So we need just uh, basically these uh, kind of this kind of um, barrier method. So if you can construct something deterministically, uh, then uh, it happens with positive density. As long as whatever you want is stable under small perturbation. For example, things like area and perimeter, if you have nodal domain of a function, you perturb function a little bit, uh, nodal domains move just by a little bit, so area moves by a little bit. If your, if your perturbation is small, not only in C1, but in C2, then also lengths of nodal lines, they uh, perturb by uh, just a little bit. And another direction of generalizations is 
related to this kind of scaling limit. So you can work. So in this proof, we have one field and we take larger and larger domains. But what you can do is take, for example, a fixed domain on a sphere and you look at family of uh, Gaussian fields uh, that have uh, local scaling limits. Uh, then you can uh, do the same as well. So for example, if you have a family of uh, fields on a manifold and locally they have scaling limit for each scaling and let's assume that each scaling limit is a stationary field. They might be different uh, stationary fields at different points, but each field will have this, um, this positive constant A. But now this positive constant A might depend on a point where you pass to the scaling limit. Then, uh, if you take number of nodal domains for the entire kind of fi uh, field in the entire manifold uh, and rescale it in certain way and pass to the limit, then what you will get uh, something like density of uh, nodal domains per uh, unit volume, it will be just integral of this constant A over the manifold. Okay, uh, now, uh, excuse me, uh, yeah. are there uh, any examples of um, quantities that are not stable under these uh, uh, small perturbation, perturbations and are still interesting that we can no, handle not, with? Not, not that I know. So of course you can come up with a stupid example. So for example, uh, you want to look at, uh, I don't know, points where nodal lines cross, mm -hmm. something like that. Uh, this is unstable. Well, actually I, I know not so stupid example. For, uh, let's imagine that you want to look at the uh, length of nodal lines but your field is only C1 smooth. Uh, then uh, length of a curve is not smooth under C1 perturbations because C1 tells you that if you have a function and you add to it function which has small C1 norm, then you only know that not the line will move by at most epsilon for small epsilon. But of course, it doesn't mean that its length will be small. So it might be that you had some nice uh, curve and then you have small perturbation and now you know the line is close to it, but has uh, a very different length. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, all examples that I know of, so all fields that people really care about. They are even real analytic. So for them, this does not happen. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Because you also, you see, you are perturbing by other functions from your uh, Cameron Martin space. So if all of your functions are very nice, then uh, get a small perturbation by these functions, they are nice. So this is just example of a functional which is not stable enough if your functions are not nice enough. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and now uh, there is a question. What is A? Uh, and in general, it might look for generic fields, it might look like a stupid question. And in some sense it is, but for random plane wave, it is not because it's related to a meaningful question about eigenfunctions of Laplacian. 
and there this question does make sense. And this is one of uh, uh, big mysteries uh, in this field. So this is what is known as Bogomolny-Schmidt conjecture. So they propose a way how to compute. Um, and uh, so this happened, uh, I think it's uh, 2006, around, uh, around this time. Uh, so they uh, proposed the following argument. Uh, using cuts rise, it's easy to show that uh, for random plane wave, there is a typical spacing between nodal lines. Of random plane wave. And this means that, uh, and of course, this typical spacing is just the wavelength. And then they argue that this means that not the lines, lines on average, uh, form a square lattice. So let me just show uh, some pictures uh, from, so uh, this is picture from actually their paper. So not the lines uh, form on average square lattice, but here what you see is that not the lines intersect, but by Bulinska lemma, well, if you have intersection of not the lines, then at this point, uh, gradient must be zero. And Bulinska lemma tells us that this is impossible. So it means that all these, in reality, all these uh, intersections must resolve one way or another. And if you look at this, then what you will get uh, is uh, what is known as a critical percolation on square lattice. So let me ask you this question. So uh, do you know anything about uh, square lattice percolation? No. Okay, I I'll uh, explain it in a moment. So it's a very nice and uh, simple model. So what we have here is a lattice, square lattice, say black one, and then it has a dual lattice where vertices correspond to faces and faces correspond to vertices. So we have these two square lattices, black and uh, blue, and they're dual to each other. And then uh, we have pairs of edges, black edge and blue edge. They always come in pairs. And then we take a coin, maybe unfair coin, with probability p. We toss this coin. If we have heads, we keep black edge and remove blue. Uh, tails uh, keep blue, remove black. And then you get these clusters. You have black connected clusters and blue connected clusters. And you also can draw these uh, orange curves that separate uh, black and blue. And kind of color these domains. So we have kind of green domains around uh, blue clusters and white domains around black clusters. So this model is called uh, percolation bond percolation because we are playing with bonds, not with vertices. 
bond percolation on square lattice. And there is a, a kind of self-symmetric, self-dual point. So if our probability is one half, then uh, by symmetry, black clusters and blue clusters, they have the same law. We have no preference uh, of blue over black or the other way around. So this model is called uh, critical uh, bond percolation on square lattice. Now, if we go back to this picture, when we resolve uh, singularities, then uh, can you think that uh, there are these uh, square lattices, but they are tilted. So this is one square lattice and this is another. And when and then uh, when uh, blue and red intersect, sorry, I'm doing something wrong here. Um, so, so we have, um, hmm, doesn't want to be erased. Okay, let me then just um, go back to this speech. So we have plus here, plus here, minus, minus. And we have kind of nodal line, nodal line. And we extend it like this. So it's plus, minus, plus, minus. Then we have these uh, lattices, sorry, minus, that connects pluses and another lattice which connects minuses. And where we have uh, this intersection of nodal lines, it's where blue edge, so we have red edge where it crosses with uh, blue one. And so uh, we keep either one or another. So uh, here we have one, and here we have another, and we have to resolve uh, singularity. So either we keep red edge, uh, or we keep blue edge. So that's exactly uh, our uh, percolation model like here, but imagine that it's uh, like rotated by 45 degrees. Okay, so uh, what they proposed is that nodal domains of random spherical harmonic, they behave like uh, percolation clusters. So nodal domains of, uh, sorry, random plane wave look like uh, clusters in the uh, critical bond percolation on Z2, well, with certain mesh where delta is given by the wavelength.
So this is the, their kind of main insight. And then uh, number of clusters in uh, percolation is a complicated uh, subject. So it's well studied and there are some results, but usually there is no explicit answer. But square lattice is a very symmetric thing. And there is some miracle and there is a physics computation and uh, uh, number of clusters per vertex is known. And this gives us number of domains per unit volume, which is exactly our mysterious constant A. So this physics argument gives us a reasonable conjecture about the number of uh, nodal domains per unit volume. And uh, uh, in the last, uh, I would say 10 years, there was an uh, enormous amount of work in uh, trying to prove or even properly formulate uh, this conjecture. And uh, to some extent, the rest of this course will be devoted to recent results and recent attempts to prove this conjecture. And I think we are out of time for today. So do you have any uh, questions? Okay, why so, are, yeah. uh, Why are physicists uh, interested in number of nodal domains? Uh, well, basically because uh, it tells you something about number of nodal domains uh, for high energy eigenfunctions of Laplacian. And why is this interesting? For uh, well, at least one uh, answer, and this is, uh, I think, one of motivations of Bogomolny and Schmidt. There is an earlier paper uh, of, the, I think it's Bogomolny, Schmidt, and Smilansky, uh, who uh, use this uh, number of nodal domains as a criterion to figure out whether uh, quantum dynamics uh, is chaotic or not. Well, you see, kind of uh, nodal eigenfunctions of Laplacian, they appear uh, from several points of view. So, uh, they appear as uh, modes in vibration. So if you think about my uh, membrane and how it vibrates, uh, then, uh, uh, so if you have kind of um, standing wave, uh, then you will see exactly nodal domains. You know, have you seen, um, pictures that are called uh, Hladny pictures. Hladny no. pictures. So no, I didn't. Uh, it's, uh, it's the following kind of standard physics uh, experiment. So you take a, a metal plate, uh, you put fine sand on it or flour, just something. And then you start vibrating uh, this plate with different frequencies. And then each time, so for general frequencies, you see just the sand bouncing around. But when frequency goes through uh, eigenstate, through eigenfrequency of this plate, then immediately sand will uh, concentrate on a set where plate, so then vibration will become eigen Eigen function of uh, Laplacian. And so there will be parts. So there will be just one eigen mode. 
uh, and then there will be part where plate does not vibrate at all. So amplitude of vibration is given by eigenfunction. So where eigenfunction is zero, plate does not vibrate. And so the sand will accumulate on nodal lines. And as frequency changes, you immediately will see these uh, uh, changes from uh, one uh, uh, eigenstate to another. So if you uh, wait for a second, I will just uh, find uh, you some uh, video of this. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, it's, uh, it's actually uh, a beautiful uh, uh, picture. So um, yeah, le let me find some video. Um, okay, just could you hold on a second? Yeah, okay. Um, okay, so let me share screen with you. Um, so can you see the screen now? Mm, no, actually I can't. Um, okay, so now it's not on. Okay. Oh, now, now something is happening. Yes, yes. Yeah. So, um, that is, okay. Mm -hmm. So this is when you pass through again state. Can you say again how how is this uh, called? Uh, so this is uh, hladny, ah. oh, okay. hladny plate. So it's kind of one of uh, really beautiful and easy uh, physical experiments. Uh, so what happens is when you vibrate uh, a membrane with frequency which corresponds to one of uh, eigenvalues, then you will get a uh, vibration will become a standing wave. Um, and uh, so just each point will vibrate with certain amplitude, which is given by amplitude of, uh, uh, of your eigen function. And so kind of when frequency changes, you have these immediate changes from kind of one picture to another. Uh, so this is uh, uh, one thing. And also similar things appear in quantum mechanics because if you uh, write um, Schrodinger equation, then Eigen states, well, up to, well, there is complex thing, but up to this complex thing, Eigen states of this quantum system, they're given uh, by eigen functions of Laplacian. So uh, then you interpret eigen function of Laplacian as uh, it a probability density function of where you can observe your particle. And for example, not the lines are places where your particle cannot be. So uh, these, uh, these are kind of prohibited zones. Yeah, I see. That's that's very interesting. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any other questions? I have a small question about yeah. this percolation. As I understand, in percolation, uh, these interfaces they kind of converge to something like conformal loop ensemble or something. Yes. Is there something similar for our model? With nodal uh, domains. We believe, let me put it this way, we believe so. 
Uh, so uh, next time I will talk a, a little bit more about this bogomolny schmidt conjecture. There is uh, its natural generalization that indeed uh, nodal, so the conjecture is that under certain assumption on the field, uh, nodal lines will converge to this, uh, uh, S, well, kind of, long lines will converge to SLE6 curves and the entire collection of lines will converge to this conformal loop ensemble with uh, uh, parameter, well, for loop ensembles, usual parameter is C, which is central charge. And this corresponds to zero central charge. But yes, the conjecture is that in the scaling limit, uh, nodal lines, they have a limit and this limit is conformally invariant and uh, is given by conformal field theory with central charge zero. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, any other questions? Okay, then uh, that's uh, the end of uh, today's lecture. And uh, if you have any other questions, I will uh, be on this channel for another about hour. So you can just drop by and ask questions anytime. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Goodbye.